thank you for participating in the Humane Summit, a virtual speaker series brought to you by the Humane Education Coalition. This session is sponsored by the Griffin Press and the Humane Society of the United States. We are grateful for your attendance today for Dr. Bernard Unti's speaker session, The Decisive Century, The Emergence of the Kindness to Animals Ethic in the 1700s. Bernard is Senior Policy Advisor and Special Assistant to the President and CEO of the Humane Society of the United States, and he works on a wide range of strategic, policy, program, and communications priorities. An historian by training, he is the author of Protecting All Animals, a 50-year history of the Humane Society of the United States, and with Bill DeRosa, co-author of the 2003 essay, Humane Education, Past, Present, and Future. At this time, I will pass things over to our speaker, Bernard Unti. Hi, this is Bernie Unti of the Humane Society of the United States to present on the decisive century, the emergence of the kindness to animals ethic in the 1700s. I'm focusing on my remarks on the 18th century as a crucial period in the history of humane attitudes toward animals. We'll examine the sweep of events between 1693 and 1800 to learn about the foundational values that came to underlie animal protection. Humane education, like the animal protection ethic itself, predates the formal origins of animal protection. I want to frame it as part of a broad culture shift, one we see in moral philosophy, theology, psychology, the lived experience of regular people, children's education, literature, and legal protection for animals. We'll focus mostly on England where the humanitarian movement emerged most prominently. We'll discuss John Locke's influence on our understanding of the implications of cruelty to animals, Hogarth's Four Stages of Cruelty, a Prince series that makes the case in its own way, the proliferation of children's works encouraging kindness, the stirring of concern for animals in moral and theological discussion, literature, and finally, the first serious attempts to protect animals under law. Let's start with John Locke and his endorsement of the need to chastise animal cruelty and his understanding of its relationship to the problem of human violence and his environmentalist theory of human development. All of these contributions marked a turning point. Locke was the most influential person to take up this question. There's a prehistory going back to ancient times and the occasional thinker in the early modern era. Thomas Aquinas made the connection in what became the standing view of Catholicism and Christianity that cruelty could harden the hearts of humans and make them liable to be cruel to one another. You could say that there was a general indifference in the Middle Ages and the early modern period with Shakespeare something of an exception. Uh, others included uh, Margaret Cavendish, um, Bernard Mandeville, there were others. Montaigne, the philosopher skeptic, was maybe the first to cite the importance of childhood experience. Uh, some mothers think it great sport, he wrote, to see a child wring off a chicken's neck and strive to beat a dog or cat, yet they are the true deeds of cruelty, of tyranny, and of treason. Locke, however, spoke as the founder of modern educational theory. In Thoughts Concerning Human Education, he wrote, they who delight in the suffering and destruction of inferior creatures will not be apt to be very compassionate or benign to those of their own kind. Children should from the beginning be brought up in an abhorrence of killing or tormenting any living creature. Locke was also the first to suggest that pets, companion animals, had a role to play in the development of sympathetic tendencies. Remember that he wrote these things in the 17th century when Descartes and the other philosopher anatomists were taking things in the wrong direction, denying soul and feeling to animals, viewing them like clocks, the animal machines, automata. 
Locke was involved in a very serious set of debates over humanness, the qualities and characteristics of being human. This debate also involved the Cambridge Platonists, the Latitudinarian divines. The Latitudinarians were in something of a revolt against Puritanism, a kind of resistance to the Augustinianism of the Lutheran and Calvinist traditions. They sought to make the point that man was not completely depraved as a result of the fall, that man still had some natural power of doing good, that his nature can cooperate with grace toward the end of his own salvation. These divines had a great dislike for Thomas Hobbes and his moral and political doctrines. He was the man known for saying that life was nasty, brutish, and short. In Leviathan, Hobbes reduced all human motivation to egoistic passions of pride and self-esteem. Locke, of course, argued that we're born tabula rasa as a blank slate, that we are all the products of socialization and nurture. And in a sense, he swept away this debate. And he was part of an upswell of thought into the springs of human action, the social capacities of man. Benevolence and sympathy were godly. Now we could locate that benevolence in the nature of man as created by God. Locke's essay concerning human understanding is another lens on the evolution of thought here. It deals with problems of knowledge, but it also turns to moral questions, and he insists that we're motivated by pleasure and pain, that what we call good and evil are those things which produce pleasure and pain, and that our individual and social aim should be happiness all around. And the cluster of English words, language, words that cognate to human, that refer essentially to compassion as a trait, such as humane, humanitarian, uh, humanity. They have their philosophical origins in the work of Anthony Ashley Cooper, the third Earl of Shaftesbury, who was a student of Locke. No one before Shaftesbury had argued so eloquently for the identification of fellow feeling with the essence of true human nature. It's a case of virtue as benevolence, universal benevolence, and benevolence laden with feeling. Benevolence had a double sense, connoting not simply the philanthropic actions which the good man performs, but the more tender passions and affections which prompt those actions. Shaftesbury rejected Descartes' theory of animal insensibility as Locke had, and Shaftesbury was the exemplar of a new social type, a new literary type, uh, the man of feeling. His work, Characteristics of Men, Manners, Opinions, and Times, in 1711, gave humanitarian feeling toward animals the dignity of a kind of philo philosophical status. Let's move on to the four stages of cruelty by the painter engraver William Hogarth, um, a masterwork executed in 1750 and 51, and talk about the spectatorial nature of sympathy. Hogarth's captivating print series of four was an early form of social marketing to a public audience, one that cast cruelty to animals as an index of depravity and a predictor of future moral de degeneration. It's a sensational pictorial narrative showing that the abuse which occurs in childhood can lead to the worst kind of adult violence toward other human beings. It was one of the most accessible works about animal abuse in the Western world for many years, and it reached and resonated with countless people who, though frequently illiterate, could still recognize the scenes, the sights Hogarth put in front of them. The 17th century, the 18th century were cruel, cruel centuries. It was a cruel era. People went to and enjoyed hanging and other rude amusements, bear baiting, bull baiting, in this context, animal welfare. And in that respect, any kind of treatment of animals was fine if it uh, gave pleasure or profit. The first and second panels uh, in the four stages of cruelty, 
are a real window into the genuine persecution of animals, the sheer brutality of their treatment in the streets of the, metropolitan, the metro, metropolis. The most common uh, element involves a central figure uh, who goes from torturing small animals as a boy, that's Tom Nero, uh, to beating a fallen horse uh, while he's working as a coachman, to murdering his lover in the third frame, and finally to receiving his just reward of public dissection uh, after being tried, convicted, uh, and hanged. When we're thinking about cruelty as a behavior, it's also worth taking account of the theories of the, of the sociologist Norbert Elias, who talked about the civilizing process. Elias undertook a theoretical exposition of historical change based on the link between long-term structural development of societies and changes in people's behavior concerning such common natural functions as preparing and eating food, washing, spitting, even defecating. While these may appear to be trivial behaviors for focus, it's precisely the unavoidable nature of these practices that makes changes in the way that they are performed visible as social changes. Elias traced how post-medieval European standards regarding violence, sexual behavior, bodily functions, table manners, uh, and forms of speech were gradually transformed by increasing thresholds of shame and repugnance working outward from a nucleus and kind of court or aristocratic etiquette. The internalized self-restraint imposed um, by networks of social connection developed this kind of civilizing uh, psychological self-perception and self-control that Freud would later call or recognize as the superego. We're coming back to Locke to take note of his tremendous impact on the rise of a new genre of literature, literature for children. The notion that children could be socialized and nurtured in good instincts, habits, and values prompted a proliferation of works directed at children to more deeply embed values, good values, including humane values, animal welfare values, uh, amongst the young. We call this sometimes didactic literature. Didacticism is a philosophy in art or literature that emphasizes the idea that uh, works like this should convey information, instruction, uh, moral teaching, along with pleasure and entertainment. One of the most significant examples when it comes to animal protection was Sarah Trimmer's uh, fabulous histories, more commonly known as the History of the Robins, and this is a 1791 edition uh, uh, in my own possession. It's, I think, already the fourth edition, and it concerns a family of birds who um, embody the best of domestic values, and humans learn from the natural world uh, even as they uh, valorize certain kinds of um, behaviors tending toward kindness, empathy, consideration for others. This marked a real revolution, this didactic literature, uh, in the history of attitudes toward animals and in their treatment. And it's important that we notice that this involved a kind of an awakening of women and their participation in humanitarian reform. Many writers from Margaret Cavendish to Mary Wollstonecraft to Francis Power Cobb would make the connection between the treatment of women uh, and that of uh, animals. Women were frequently confined to ceaseless labor, including reproductive labor, giving birth uh, in the household. And um, we have to see the contribution of this a uh, strain of literature involving fiction promoting kindness to animals uh, as a kind of surrogate feminism. And it, wasn't a, it was not a coincidence that a, a lot of this uh, literature was produced by women who also, within the context of the domestic sphere, the household, were primarily charged with raising young people 
uh, and instilling proper values. Let's turn to literary humanitarianism because, as Shelley once observed, poets are the, missing, the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Pope, Goldsmith, Thompson, Blake, Burns, Wordsworth, Cooper, all of these poets coming from different vantages uh, reflect in their work how the humane spirit had uh, become appealing to widely differing perspectives, schools of thought, religions, philosophies, um, etc. Cooper is most important as the true embodiment of humanitarianism, not least because he's also involved in the evangelicalism, the religious movement uh, of the era. And as one commentator said, religious sensibility and benevolent sensibility, no matter what their origin, spoke in Cooper's time with one voice. I think of Cooper's great work, the task in which he said, ye therefore who love mercy, teach your sons to love it too. The century's evangelicalism is also significant, and we could not overestimate the importance of an engaged clergy uh, and religious constituency in advancing animal welfare values. The most prominent contributor in this regard is probably the founder of Methodism, John Wesley, who wrote uh, The General Deliverance in 1772, a kind of sermon um, advancing the case for animals. And Wesley was also the first person to announce his confident belief in an afterlife for animals, a theologically very significant uh, gesture or position to take. Evangelicalism rested strongly on the Old Testament as distinct from the New Testament. And of course, there's a very strong warrant for kindness to animals in the Old Testament, much more so than in the New. So this was significant uh, for the era's evangelicalism and its connection to animal protection. Humanitarian was also pretty latitudinarian. That is to say, it fit pretty well within a variety of strains of philosophy, thought, uh, and feeling. Um, corporal punishment of children, the insane, of animals, cruel and unusual punishment of various kinds. This is what I mean when I talk about the era of biopolitics. I mean it in this sense, the advent of the era of political advocacy for the benefit of non-human life. There are other definitions that need not concern us uh, here. Before this period, we see in the, the Puritan body of liberties and a few other edicts, expressions of concern for animals, generally tied to the understanding that a mistreated animal was a valueless animal. Even Locke, in two treaties on government, uh, said that domestic animals kept for pleasure and advantage uh, are taken care of not out of any love the master has for them, but love of himself uh, and the profit that they bring him. So there's a kind of a basic uh, use-oriented argument for taking good care of animals. But I would want to say that there can be complementary motives to our desire to protect animals. And a combined perspective draws together practical arguments, arguments about uh, moral progress, arguments about social disorder and the need to control rude and cruel and violent public behavior, um, a recognition of the tie between cruelty to animals and interpersonal violence. All these things come together. This is one of the reasons why I love and want to close with this observation from Lord Thomas Erskine in 1809. He offered this remarks in the aftermath of a losing effort, the second attempt to pass an anti-cruelty measure in the parliament. There was a bull baiting measure in 1802 that went down. Then in 1809, the bill for preventing malicious and wanton cruelty to animals, uh, that failed too. But Erskine in the second case recognized it as a watershed and he left us a serious, serious indication of his convictions by writing, the attending to the feeling of the animal itself and preventing cruelty from a consideration of its suffering was certainly new and deserved to be considered as an era in legislation. Erskine wrote this in the May 8, 1810 Hansard, 
just a few weeks after uh, these events. He's telling us right after these significant events that this is the beginning of a new era in the human-animal relationship, one of legal protections. Supporters were pushing three premises. Humanity to animals would redound to men. Sympathy and benevolence come naturally to humankind. Animals have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I hope this snapshot of a decisive century is helpful to those committed to humane education. Implicitly, as we've seen here, humane education predates the organization of the humane movement itself. This is tremendous evidence that awareness and sensibility are the necessary precondition of legislative action. That's one of the main reasons I personally consider humane education so vital to animal protection work, and it's why I want always to be counted amongst its strongest advocates, hopefully with many of you. I hope today's presentation has uh, inspired your interest and enthusiasm for learning more about the history of humane education and animal protection, and that you'll follow up with further study. Please feel free to get in touch with me through the conference organizers or by other means, and thanks for your attention today. I really appreciated it. This concludes our speaker session. Thank you so much for joining us. You can learn more here or by clicking the resource links in the summit. We hope you've enjoyed this speaker session and that you'll join us for another one soon. Please consider making a donation to the Humane Education Coalition to help us continue providing programs and events like the Humane Summit. We rely on your support to help create a more compassionate, just, and sustainable future through education. Visit hecoalition.org give to contribute today. Thanks again.